Saunders, Section V, Vienna. You're bloody late. This is a mission, not a fancy dress ball. We have time. Now, where's our man? He's in the box between the KGB minders. No, not that box, you muppet. Lovely girl with a cello. As I said, this is a mission, not a fancy dress ball. Forget the ladies for once, Ballard. Koskoff will leave here during the interval. We'd better go. Turn off the lights. Now let's understand one another, Ballard. I have to explain the plot to the audience. General Koskoff is a top KGB mastermind. His defection is my baby. He contacted me. I've planned this out to the last detail. You'll want the soft-nosed ones, I expect. No, steel-tipped. KGB snipers usually wear body armour. What's your escape plan? Sorry, old man. Section 26, paragraph 5. That information is on a need-to-know basis only. I'm sure you understand. Koskoff is under intensive KGB surveillance. A sniper has been assigned to watch him, and he expressly asked for you to protect him. Why me? He's under the impression that you're the best. Where's the car? In the alley, out the back. Bring the chair. It'll take them about 10 seconds to reach us. Enough time for the sniper to make strawberry jam of him. There's Koskoff now. What's he waiting for? Sniper. Two floors up, centre window. It's the girl with the cello. Fire, Ballard, fire. Shoot her! What are you waiting for? You missed! Deliberately! Where is he? In the boot. That's the first place they look. But my escape plan? Scrubbed. And how will we get Koskoff out? You drive Koskoff to the Trans-Siberian Pipeline substation. Meet Rosika Miklas. She's our man here. She'll introduce you to the pig and to Koskoff's new escape route. Meet me at the border, 2300 hours. Be there. Where are you going? I'm going to find the girl with the cello. 
Don't worry, my interest in her is strictly professional. Yeah, right. And how are you going to get her to talk to you? Sorry, old man. Section 26, paragraph 5. That's need to know. Sure you understand. Welcome friends, welcome friends, welcome one and all. Blair Ballard, the Bon Vivant, very much at your service. I do hope that you're all in the finest of form. Now, we are still in the throes of the 60th anniversary celebrations for 007 on the big screen. I was fortunate enough this week to be invited to an exclusive launch party at Lock & Co, where they've set up their heritage section with a selection of Eon props and hats from the archive. I did a video of the launch party itself with Meg Simmons guiding us around the different uh, lots, which you can see in a link up in the corner now. Now, the launch party itself was actually opened by none other than Mariam Dabo, who played Karamolovi in one of my favorite Bond films, The Living Daylights. Now, I thought it'd be remiss of me not to take Mariam to one side and have a quick chat to her, but that chat spun out into a wonderful interview. We talk about love and life and life on set. It really is one of my favorites. She's an incredibly warm and generous person with her time. If you do enjoy this video, please feel free to smirch those like and subscribe buttons. It really brings a smile to my face. But for now, let's dip into this wonderful, wonderful interview. Well, I'm here with the absolutely fabulous Mariam Debo, who we all know as Kara Milovi from The Living Daylights. Thanks so much for, for joining hello, us. Hello, hello, hello. Lovely hello. to meet you. <laughs> lovely to do this interview for I know, you. It's I'm great thrilled. stuff. I mean, it's uh, fun. Fun it, memories. It's fun. I mean, it's been, yeah. been, uh, we've been chatting. We've actually been chatting downstairs, and it's yes. been wonderful. We've had a great time here at Lock & Co. Yeah. The exhibition downstairs is, is absolutely crazy. We thought we'd come Stunning. upstairs a bit more better light and a bit better, better environment. But um, And I'm wearing a new, new edition of... Uh, this hat that's just come out today, but actually, Sean Connery wore it in uh, Doctor No. That's right. So yeah, it's the are. James that's just. And been I released. chose that one. I love it. It's the best one. It's, yes, the, I mean, it's the one classic. that's been uh, screen matched, you know, yeah. with the with the one the green that he wore in Doctor No, and it, you're rocking it. Absolutely rocking it. Thank you, <laughs> thank you, and uh, very happy to be here uh, oh, cool. and do this for you. Great stuff. Okay. Thank you. And then in 1918, from 1980 to 1920, then um, the Red Army came in, they had to cave in because uh, he had an army of only 10,000 and the, 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 the Red Army, the Russians were 25, 30,000 and they were used mm. to the snow, the cold and all that and the Georgians weren't. And so um, in, the, in that last battle, just above Tbilisi, which is the capital of Georgia, mm -hmm. Uh, my grandfather made a decision then because also the government was letting the Red Army come in um. that he didn't want all his soldiers to die. So they, they sort of capitulated and he escaped with his wife and his three daughters through the south of Georgia, Batumi, Black Sea, and arrived in Turkey, spent a year there, then arrived um, as political refugees in, in Paris with nothing, just two suitcases and his three daughters and his wife and the nanny who was a great cook. Um, <laughs> and they just took a train and went out at the last stop in this little town called Chateau, which is west uh, uh, of Paris. Uh -huh. And that's where they, they made their, their life there. And uh, um, Babali, who was the nanny, was dressed in black in this her outfit, like, because um, she came from the mountains in Georgia. She made incredible um, uh, yogurt when yogurt did not exist in France. So then people started buying a lot of yogurts uh, so that in the could neighborhood. Be the start of the, the but, yogurt. But the yogurt, he was a start, <laughs> but in fact, the man came and asked my grandfather if he wanted to go into partnership. My grandfather was not a businessman, he, you know. He said, no, no, we're very, we're happy, we're, we're filming. I mean, we're, we're actually, um, you know, feeding people that are around in our little town, you know, we, we and it was done on. You know, oh, no way! He could have been very rich. Oh. <laughs> and then actually Danon did in the 1970s, they did a commercial 
they did a commercial on yogurt, you know, the Danone yeah. yogurt, and say, saying that, uh, in fact, Georgian people, look why Georgian people live so long. And you see this 80-year-old man, you know, eating yogurt, and then you see the 120-year-old mother <laughs> who comes into shot, you know, Georgian. <laughs> like a mother, you know, like yeah, babushka. Georgian. Um, uh, babushka is Russian, but I mean, you know, similar sort of, you know, whatever. But like the Georgians live long because of yogurt. So that you were kind of like, you know, so your grandfather basically has helped the, the, the French. The I French know. I mean, you know, there, there was incredible yogurt in Turkey, in Greece, uh, and Georgia, all of that region, you know. That's so, uh, that's so yeah. bizarre. But it came full circle because yeah. in the living daylights, obviously you well, go I played back. Czech. You played yes. Czech, you were Czech, but you I went back Czech. You went and fought with the Mujahideen with against the, the Soviets. So you're kind of like, the, the circle is complete, really. Yes, I hadn't thought of that. It's true. <laughs> I don't, know if, I don't know if I was fighting against but, the Soviets, oh, but James Bond was. <laughs> but uh, I mean, what I found when I when I when I mentioned to friends that I might be coming to to yes. oh, coming to the event, but might be able to chat to you, is that 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 um that the Living Daylights is you know one of the the, the the most romantic of the Bond films. I mean, you've got on oh, the Magic Secret Service, obviously, when he gets married and falls in love with with yes, Tracy. and then she's killed. Spoiler alert! Yeah, spoiler alert, guys. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but, but then um obviously Casino Royale as well when he falls in love with Eva Green's character. Yes, but yes. for for the Living Daylights, people really picked up on the I mean the the romance and the chemistry that you and Tim Dalton had on screen. When you were filming, did you feel that chemistry? I mean, was it something that um, it seemed so genuine and so so wonderful, and people picked up on that when watching the film? Well, I, I think you know, um, chemistry on film is extraordinary when it happens between actors, and uh, I think um, Timothy um, was such a, a wonderful um, actor to work with, and I'm so glad I did it with him um, because he comes from the theatre. It's all about you know collaboration, teamwork. You know, and he, he could see, of course, that I'd never worked on such a big movie in my life. And so he was supporting me, you know, carrying me through. Uh, and those scenes were um, romantic because we were, you know, the Ferris wheel, homage to the third man, you know, when we were in Vienna. And it was filmed there, wasn't yeah. it? Oh, absolutely yeah, absolutely right. Uh, the Ferris wheel was, was very nice, you know. Uh, it's the one where he talks about the cuckoo clock. But you, know, you were Joseph quite, clock. I mean, I know you But uh, I didn't like the roller coasters. <laughs> Ah, I was like miserable, but we sure. spent the whole night in that incredible old uh, uh, fun fair. Unbelievable, um, and then um, yeah, in Morocco we had some uh, romantic scenes. And then John Barry, of course, composed the most beautiful uh, uh, music for the love scenes. Um, I've never seen bless you again. Really. It was the last film, wasn't it? I mean, you, the you last and Laurie film as well. Did, yeah. his, his wife Laurie, you kind of uh... Laurie Barry, and I. Yes, we always used to hang out with Barbara. It's a big family, and so when you're working on a film for five months, you tend to be with everybody. And so, of course, Barbara and um, Cubby were always including me, uh, uh, including us, you know. Um, and I'd see John and Laurie, uh, yes, a lot, because obviously he was, you know, writing the music. And then, sure. and then um, uh, Chrissy Hind uh, wrote uh, two songs. Very um, cool, very cool. And the, la the, the love song is at the end of the film, which I love, which she wrote, which on, John Barry had composed, you know, from seeing those love scenes. So that helped also the romance. But working with Tim was an absolute delight. He's a marvellous actor, um, and he is such a good actor that he sort of, you know, brought me up at one level. Sure. Um, and yes, he was, you know, Timothy has, has you know, he's a good actor, uh, he's got incredible training background. He's got this marvelous talent. He's got this marvelous voice, like an opera singer, you know. And an actor that's so important. And he's sure. so and he's so handsome. And he no. he, but <laughs> but oh, he's a, a but. he's a he's a thoughtful Bond, and he thought about his character. And when he came on the scene to be uh, James Bond, they changed the style of Bond, and they always do that with the new actor who is going to be playing James Bond. And Timothy, uh, importantly, said, you know, I want to go back to the classic Bond. Mm -hmm. And actually, to the, 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 the novels, Ian Fleming's novels, but also bring the humanity of Bond in, in you know, make him more human. Sure, he's not uh, a More thoughtful, yeah. you know. Um, and it's true, I, I hadn't seen the film in, I don't know, 
decades. Well, it's been 35 And it was on at the BFI. Years. Oh, was it? You went yeah, to see it? went to see it. Um, and sitting at Tim and thinking, my God, he's good. He, it's, he's, his performance is not age. He's so good in it. I mean, it's a hilariously funny film now because a lot of things are politically incorrect and I'm so naive, you know, I'm playing this musician and I'm like, I've got these lines. But on the whole, it's a very enjoyable film oh. and John Glenn, you know, who directed uh, us all was a delight to work with. It's a very, very happy um, five months shooting. I mean, the, for the producers, it was complicated because you had to shoot in Morocco. You can imagine with the arms coming through, but they're sure. fake arms, but they look real, you know, I mean, all of that was hectic for the producers. But it was a very joyful uh, experience. Um, and in Vienna, and for me it was very joyful because I spent a month working with this lovely cello teacher. Um, she was Polish, I think. Beautiful young girl and um, wonderful cello player. And so she, she was teaching me, um, you soap the bow with dry oh, soap. Oh, so it doesn't make any noise when you... Yeah, oh, yeah, yes. Driving crazy, people crazy. <laughs> no. So, and um, when I ended, uh, in, when we were in Vienna, and we were shooting this, this scene um, at the Royal Opera House in Vienna, um, with the symphony orchestra, and John Barry was conducting, and I was there with my cello, and I really felt I was playing. I can imagine. It must have been I really felt feeling. I was playing. I was transported by this incredible orchestra, that, you know. And was I was like backstage playing. doing playing your part. No, no, so no, 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 no. There probably was another cellist that was there. They, you know, because usually have you know a couple of couple. Of, yeah. yeah. What a feeling to f be on stage with totally. John Barry, obviously and, as well. And, I mean, that's complete make believe, and I really believed I was playing. That's acting. That's, but, it's, but I mean, that's I mean, well, what an I experience mean, for you. They had to do a few cuts, of course, to make it look real uh, when they had the close-ups on me because it's really hard to play the jello. But I mean, it, it, really it does hard. look. I mean, I've known friends really who it looks like you're actually playing. You did yeah. a very good job. Well, I had to learn uh, mime all the, the Dvorak, you know, pieces, um, and um, and then the hands when it's close up of the hands. Did you, it's not your me, fingers? How were your fingers by the end of it, though? Well, it was quite funny because I was taking horse riding le lessons. Um, and cello lessons and I was walking like a cowboy <laughs> and my back was aching because the cello you hold it like this right sure and then the horse you're like this and then I had my fingers I mean <laughs> so it's a thighs of steel by the end yeah, as well <laughs> it's quite funny but it was a it was a very um, you know a happy experience but um, talking about your horse riding there because you had a beautiful white stallion and is it true that you used to sneak off during your lunch breaks to is go, you go full on, full on, no, I did, it, I did it once and I was really told off. <gasps> oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Insurance. I did that at, oh, at lunch break because we had gone off, all of us, with the stuntmen. Um, uh, we w went off um, riding in the desert with our horses before we started filming to get used to our sure. horses. Mm -hmm. I felt like I was in Lawrence of Arabia. <laughs> <laughs> but it was wonderful. I had the most beautiful uh, white Arabian horse. It was gorgeous. Um, and I did go off at lunch break, but not far enough for them to stop me, and, and quite rightly so, because, you know, it was irresponsible, because what happens if I fell? You know, I'm the insurance, of the, the filming, and it all takes, you know. So, but it was just, couldn't help it. it was I mean, the, 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 you know, the yeah. dunes and the sun, the sunsets, and I mean, it's very romantic. Yeah. That must have, you know, helped, you know, to yeah. get into the... Yeah, and those horses were wonderful, and for the poor horses, there was this virus, this disease going around, the coughing disease, they all had a lung uh, oh, virus that those poor horses, had, you know. So um, I kept thinking, oh my God, I hope they're going to take care of those horses and, you know, get them better and all of that. Yeah. Uh, in Morocco. <laughs> you in Morocco, you think, yeah, look after them, please but, look after but them. But no, it was beautiful and, and, you know, getting up at dawn to go filming was oh, incredible. I mean, the scenery yeah. was just Well, my remarkable. brother and I, we used to live in the Middle East and, you know, we go out to the desert, the Wahiba Sands and Oman, just the sun, the sunrise and sunset, it's just epic, isn't I it? I miss it, actually. I, know. I really miss it. I find it, you know, spending a winter in England is... I know. Tough. It's been wintering really, in Antigua or somewhere. Really, yeah. and I don't know if it's because of my Georgian, you know, the fact that I'm half Georgian and I've never lived in Georgia. I was not born in Georgia. I was born in London. Um, but I did, I grew up with the Georgian community when we moved to Paris. Mm -hmm. um, but there's something about, you know, Middle East and like the music uh, and the sexy. desert. It's very intense. Everything I love intense. it. I love Everything. it. And I, I really, when I go to places, um, 
in Af Africa, in Kenya, or I've been in Lamu, mm. and you hear, you know, the prayers four times a day, and you've got this sort of scenery in this vista, and the people in the wind, and the... It's the, so sexy. It, it's sexy, but it's also, it's, I feel like I'm, I belong. Home. You're home. I yeah. don't. Of course I don't. But I feel very connected, somehow. Are you partial to a Hachapuri? I mean, I used to go to, I, I studied in Russia, and I used to go to, we used to go to Georgian restaurants. And Hachapuri. Hachapuri? Yeah. Love it. Lethal. <laughs> I love it. Hatsapuri and, and chacha. Yeah, yeah, chacha. yeah, absolutely. Oh, man. They're great Georgian wine. Oh, I know. Fantastic Georgian wine. Eh? Chacha, hatsapuri. Um, matsuni is, is the yogurt. Oh, yeah. Special uh -huh. yogurt, that they, the way they used to make it. Um, and I remember that in, in, in our cellar in, in, in outside of Paris. Um, there were these sort of big jars, jars of, of, yeah. of matsuni. It was incredibly oh. delicious, and I used to be told off because I used to finish the pots. <laughs> and they had to be sold. <laughs> oh, we were selling them. We were selling oh, them. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah, well, it was a way to survival. Georgia, didn't Georgia invent wine? It's the, there, is, there is a saying, there's a lot of myths about Georgia, like, you know, um, the cross first arrived in Georgia, and then Russia demanded it. Because, you know, Russia was pagan and then mm -hmm. to, uh, rushed to modern it 200 years later. But then, you know... Oh, hang on, can we move your... Um, your sorry, your, yeah. your... So, um, so uh, but there is a, a myth that um, Georgians invented wine, and this saint um, came from Israel, and she arrived in, in the fields of Georgia. She was escaping, you know, and she passed out because of all the vineyards and <laughs> wine or whatever. There's this myth. But there is, there is a, there's a truth in, it's been 5,000 years now that the Georgians make the wine in the old fashion. A lot of them still do, where they, I don't know how they do it, but it's the old way of making wine. Mm -hmm. And then you can find places in Georgia where they do it like that. And I have to say, um, particularly the red wine. Mm, yeah. My God, it's good. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, so, um, but, uh, yeah, there's a lot of myths about Georgia, you know. But, uh, yeah, so there was, there was this myth about this uh, woman who became a saint and who, from Israel, and who fainted in the fields of Georgia. Uh, and Christianity, you know, um, was born. I don't, I, 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 <laughs> but, you know, Armenia, they were Christians before the Georgians, but, I mean, by very little, but those two countries, because like, the rest of, uh, of that region were, didn't have Christianity or anything. So, so I think it's because it's kind of a silk road, you know, on the Georgia, way through, on yeah, the way through. Sure, sure. Um, and, and the thing is, is that about Georgia, and so many people have said that, um, Fitzroy MacLean being... Yes, I was going to talk to him, you know, the Bond reference obviously there as well. Well, because I met him a couple of months after we opened uh, um, uh, here um, with the Bond premiere uh, at the Odeon Leicester Square in, uh, I think it was uh, June 1987 when we had our big premiere with yeah, Prince Charles in, yeah. yes, and Diana. You were very well informed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We did have uh, trouble getting in because uh, Timothy uh, thought that uh, we, 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 he came to pick me up in Fulham and the car was too big to go through the small streets and then we had to hit Fulham Broadway. The traffic was a nightmare anyway. By the time we arrived in Leicester Square, they'd closed everything. Uh, and um, the Bobby there, um, when we came out of the car, when we wanted to go through with the car, I said, no, no, too late, it's close. And uh, Timothy said, well, actually, we're, we're in the film, in the James Bond film. He said, oh, yeah? Uh, and uh, he says, well, actually, I'm the lead in the Bond. Oh, yeah, yeah, and you're George Lazenby. <laughs> um, and Timothy just got like, you know, we were, we were running late, and Prince Charles and um, yeah. Princess Diana were arriving, and we were going to be later than them, and we had to be lined up, you know, in the lineup. So he just grabbed me by the hand and we walked through the crowds and it was a heat wave and I was wearing a very, very tight, long uh, Ungaro dress, Emmanuel Ungaro. Mm -hmm. So I was walking like a geisha, <laughs> geisha sort of. Anyway, but um, to get back on sidetrack with what oh, I was yeah, going to say. Uh, Fitzroy McLean. Three months later, I went to Scotland with these friends of mine um, and we ended up having lunch. Uh, Amabel Fraser, who, um, whose cousin uh, was married to Fitzroy MacLean. And I sat next to him at lunch. We're outdoors and I'm, I'm friends with uh, Amabel's son. So we were all there having a big lunch and we were doing a whole journey in Scotland by car. 
And I was fascinated by him. He was about 80 already, you know, and charming and, you know. And Very Bondian then, then, really. So Bondian. And so <laughs> he was so chuffed to have, you know, a Bond girl next to him. And so he was telling me how, you know, the same generation he knew Ian Fleming, you mm -hmm. know, that all that group, Noel Coward, it was all of that same group. But then when he find out, found out that I was half Georgian, he, like, because he was posted, he was... Um, he had to go to Moscow mm -hmm. to be there as a diplomat, you know. And he went all over the Caucasus and fell in love with Georgia. And he wrote a book. He wrote an incredible book with in beautiful pictures on Georgia, the Caucasus. And he said, it's one of my favorite countries in the world. And he said, I can't believe you're half Georgian. So he was telling me all about, you know, his trip to Georgia. And so and he signed me um, his book. So, you know, it was quite... You know, uh, nice to be sitting next to him. You know, amazing. But your character yeah. was based on, wasn't it Fleming's step half sister or? Was it? I don't even I think know. Think so. I, was, I come from a short, short, short story. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Octopussy. It was. Uh, uh, it was either Octopussy in the Living Daylights or just Octopussy Karim, Gun. You yeah. Know. But uh, thank Karamilari. goodness they changed your name though, because in the film you're known as Trigger. At the end of the book, Trigger. you're Trigger. It's like I had flashbacks of Del Boy and, you know, and oh, only fools right. and horses. Oh, yeah, because right. the, the actual yeah. character, the sniper, was called Trigger. I think oh, it was really? Like some, but but thanks, so thank that. goodness they changed your name. Yeah. Well, talking about the names, you know, having done uh, the documentary on the Bond girls. I was going to talk about that. Yes, yeah. the Bond girls documentary. Well, all the names that the, the the actresses are just sort of like you know Lois Charles, so it's just telling me you know. You know, when I did the Bond film, I was like, how am I going to tell my mother to, you know, that I'm called Dr. Goodhead? That's my character. You know, so it was very, it was really lovely to celebrate um, How did that come about? Women. How did that come about? You know, because you did the documentary and then the book kind of went on the back of that. How did yeah, that Yeah, it would have been lovely if the book came at the same time as a documentary, but the, the timing, could, it couldn't work. Um, so it came, I think, a, a year later or two years later. Um, how did it come about? I I had the idea. Uh, I we'd just done I just done a, um, a photo shoot with Annie Lebovitz, you know, all the Bond girls I for the Vanity that. Fair yeah, issue, beautiful. and um, and I have a couple of girlfriends who uh, who played uh, uh, like Lois Charles and all that, and I was you know developing. I produced and did a play that was in a Bethany play in London. Anyway, so got a long story short, she said you must do something, and then I just thought you know what. I always like doing, developing stories about, you know, women's journeys, you know, in whatever field it is. And has there ever Your been field, something, yeah. has anything been done from the point of view of the, of the actresses, the women and the evolution of the roles in, in, in James Bond and how the roles have evolved and gone from Bond girls to Bond women, you know, and how, you know, James Bond boss became a woman, you know. Uh, and um, so that was my story. And I couldn't get arrested in England. Nobody, no broadcaster was, in, was interested. Oh, seriously? Nobody. I mean, like, I got dismissed. America, this one guy at MGM says, I think you've got a brilliant idea. Yeah, it was, it was, it had never been done before, uh, a story um, seen through the point of view of the actresses, what they went through in their decade, mm -hmm. um, how the role um, you know, was not yet developed and, and, and or, you know, um, brought humor in the 60s, but was very cartoon-like. Um, but, you know, I actually had interviewed Camille Saviola, Camille LaPaglia, sorry, the feminist, the American oh, oh, feminist, right, okay, Camille, yes. what's her name, Camille LaPaglia? I can't remember now, it's been so long since she's done the documentary. She's quite a big feminist and uh -huh. she... And she loved the 60s that women, because she says, you know, they're like sirens. They're like sirens, and they're coming to taunt their Ulysses, you know. So she, she so it's quite interesting hearing her analogy. Um, and of course, then you had the 70s when it got more serious, and the, you know, um, Maud Adams did talk about how she was, you know, bashed around. I mean, when the man in the golden gun, he hits her yeah, with the gun. Yeah, it's quite violent. Quite violent. And with then, Bond as well. And then with Roger yeah. Moore uh, in Octopussy, he, um, he slaps her. You know, so there was that period of the 70s where you felt well, for women who'd been victimized. And, 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 you, and then you had the 80s with me in 87, which was a sort of transition where suddenly, you know, it was more about a, sort of a relationship, a romance going on with Bond. Yeah. Um, 
make it more more uh, sort of real. It seemed really genuine on screen. It so was they more were moving, organic. moving. And a monogamous bond as well, and the yeah. Kind of, uh, and they said it had to do with the with the AIDS time, but actually, I think the, the script was written before all of that exploded. In fact, the film came out when it, it exploded, so it was t it was timely. But I don't necessarily think that they wrote it thinking of AIDS, but they sure. thought it about doing a different style and bringing a more thoughtful bomb, which is what Hugh, um, Tim, yeah. Tim wanted. Hugh's my husband. <laughs> Tim wanted, therefore, bringing a more thoughtful little relationship in there. So I had a story as the girls were, the roles were evolving mm -hmm. for, for my documentary, and AMC loved it in America. They thought, great idea. And of course, the climax of my story was Judy Dench. I know, of course, it's come full circle. So, I mean, Judy, yes. obviously, you know, standard bearer being M, a female M. Was yeah, so she became, you know, James Bond's boss, but that also reflected what was going on at MI. Stella, MI. Stella Rimington, you know. Stella Rimington, exactly. Yes, exactly. So they, and they always try to do that, the producers, uh, when they, they, they get together and start working on a new screenplay with the, their writers, they're always looking, you know, how this is reflect with the times and, you know. Sure. Um, so, and it was the same thing with the, with, the, with the roles. And then, because the roles got bigger and, and, and more, 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 more sort of, you know, um, uh, more muscular, more, had more meat to, 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 to the, 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 the female mm -hmm. roles, then they could bring stars, you know. So they had, you know, famous actors who came, uh, actresses, you know, Halle Berry, she, she won an Oscar actually when the Bond movie came out. Yeah. Um, so, so it sort of evolved that way, and, um, and now Bond has had a girlfriend in two films. I know. I mean, what are your thoughts about? Because I mean, the 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 book and your documentary finished with Halle Berry and Die Another Day. What are your thoughts about the Daniel Craig era, the tenure there? I mean, well, we did a revamp. Oh, I haven't seen that. Yeah, um, the Eon asked me if we could do a revamp, so it went up to uh, Eva Green. Oh, right. So, okay. So, and I interviewed her, so, and so, and that obviously was a really interesting role she had, fantastic yeah. role. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great role. Um, what do I think now of the, the, the... What about the ending? What did you think about them, you know, killing off Daniel Craig at the end of No Time to Die? Was it something that, I mean, because it's very divisive. I'm personally, I mean, I'm not a mad fan of it. Not because I don't think that they can kill off James Bond necessarily, but I thought it was a kind of... It didn't really, didn't really chime with me. What are your thoughts? I mean, is it maybe they're fed up and they want to stop? <laughs> they just want to, okay. Yeah, Michael's going. Michael and Barbara are going. Just look. Like, oh, okay, enough, enough, enough is enough. enough. No, I think it was a dramatic ending. Um, I won't give my opinions um, mm -hmm. too much, but I mean, you know, Bond is Bond, so they can reinvent Bond in three, four years' time. Sure. Um, it could be the little baby. I don't know. Although the little baby in three, four years' time will only be three, four years old. <laughs> what about your, per, okay, if we had a magic, you know, Bond, conf, you know, machine, which Bond girl would you have loved to have played? Which of the, um, of the, 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 the Bond women, Bond girl um, actresses or parts really would you have loved to have got your teeth stuck into? You mean and, going back in time? Well, if you, if you had a chance to be in any of the other Bond films as any of the other Bond women, which would you have gone for, do you think? Well, I very much like Michelle Yeoh. Mm, yeah, she kicked ass. Uh, she kicked ass, and she had something very natural mm. um, and real about her. That was also a change. Yeah, I loved Anna Blackman. Oh, who doesn't? I mean, she was wonderful. She was really wonderful. I, uh, of course, I loved Dinah, Dinah Rigg, but she she didn't last long. <laughs> um, sure. And then I, um, out of the recent, um, funny enough. I think you know all the actresses are wonderful that have been in the recent Bond movies, but I don't find. Um, I I thought I would have had more humour personally. Maybe I was missing more humour, but it's more dramatic because yes, after 9/11 everything changed, and therefore Daniel Craig was cast. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and Barbara Broccoli was very much at the centre of that to, to to fight for him to to be Bond because. You know, 9-11 just changed everything and they couldn't, you know, be tongue in cheek. They had to really get edgier and gritty, more real and yeah. gritty. Mm -hmm. It's the whole world that changed. We, sure. we looked at the world differently. But, uh, and I liked Halle Berry uh, so much. I can't just think right now, but, you know, so many of the actresses were wonderful. Um, I think, I mean, from a, from, a, from a perspective, people say, oh, you know, that 
that Bond girls were just bits of fluff that kind of were just, you know, cannon fodder for, you know. But there was some very strong Bond role. I mean, very. Luciana Luzzi you were talking about before. Oh, I mean, Luciana was fantastic. She's wonderful. Playing the villainous. And then I love the one, um, I can't remember her name, she's a Polish actress, stunning, who, who kills men with her legs. Oh, um, uh, yeah, yeah, Famke Janssen. Famke she, Janssen. Did, she did, you know, yeah, exactly. She's brilliant. It's actually referenced in Living She's Daylights. Brilliant. And when they're, when they're seeing yeah. um, Q and, um, yeah. and Moneypenny, yeah. they're looking through people who might, you know, yeah. who, the assassins. And one of, them, when, one of the ones they have is this big woman who's like, you know, yeah, she kills, you know, kills her guys by, you know, you know strangulation or th with her thighs. Absolutely... So that's carried on with, um, yeah. Yeah, with, it was with, hilarious. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah seriously. I mean, that's, you know, what a that way to go. That was really good. <laughs> no, there were a lot of uh, uh, wonderful uh, female characters in Bond. And they're not necessarily the romantic loved one. They could be the, the villainess. Of course, the villains are always more fun to play sure. for an actor. But um, I think that um, James Bond would be utterly boring without uh, his world of women. Of course. Utterly. I'm How could he survive totally without, without in, encountering his sirens, you know? Well, you, you make the yeah. film. I mean, it, it's, you have gadgets, you have girls, and you have, you know, the yeah. cars. And, but that's, that's, it's part of the Bond world. And it's, it's part of the Bond world. I'm not sure I, I um, you know, it's, it's an opinion, but about having a girlfriend, you know, girlfriend throughout, uh, I don't know. I, mm. I, I sort of, but, but that's also, it's a generational thing. I come from, you know, the 60s. So for me, Bond was always on his own for moving. And, Francie, and he might fall for, for an incredible woman who was amazing. But then in the end, he'd always, you know, move on. Yeah. Like I say, he was working That's for... That's him, he's a flawed character. He was he's working not. for the Queen, but now he's not working for the Queen it's anymore. It's king and country now, isn't it? King and country, so it's very different. But it's so, uh, um, you know, but um, they will know where they're going to go with it. Um, it's going to be an interesting, for, you know... For sure, James Bond will always be uh, a man, because mm -hmm. then you create a female hero, you don't need, you know... They can make a, they can do a separate yeah. series. I mean, it's not, you know, it's, it's also... But he has can. to be, you know, and I think he has to be English. And he has to be flawed as well. He has to be someone that has, you know, as one of the other, the other uh, channels said, you know, we don't want James Bond to be reflecting of our normal life. I mean, I, I wasn't sure about having a baby. It's like, you know, stopping off on the wait on a mission to get some pampers from the shop to make sure your baby's gone. It, Bond should be a flawed character who makes mistakes, but he falls in love, but he, but he, but he can, you know, he's... But you see, uh, in Honor Majesty's Secret Service, he gets married yeah. and then she's killed. Yeah. yeah. There, he's with her, she has the baby and he gets killed. Yeah, so so let's see and wait and how they manage to sort of you know twirl that around. It, there'll be time for people to sort of you know relax into sure. it for three four years and they'll come up with uh, some good idea. If, sure, they if, will. They're if always, they, 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 they Michael and Barbara are very good. Yeah, at yeah, that. reinvention you know, and you reinvention know. and they get a, a really fantastic uh, group of uh, writers around the table and they'll mm. be uh, brainstorming for. Many weeks. <laughs> Indeed. Many, many years. Many, many months. Years, yeah, yeah, many absolutely. months. Well, look, Mary, so. it's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks Aww. so much for spending... I mean, we've torn you away from the party downstairs. No, that's so fine. That's fine. Oh, I do want to say that I always love humour um, in, in James Bond. And it's not this slapstick humour, but I do think that what they've done brilliantly is brought back you with Ben Whishaw. Mm -hmm. um, because I had lovely, I had lovely um, Desmond Llewellyn, and you know, and I those are little touches in in the film that are that you know have to stay. That little repartee, yeah. the banter, the oh, it's wonderful. It was just, it was well, in the Living been. Daylights, it's a hilarious moment where Timothy's there and and Q is showing him, you know, how to use this uh, this pen. Um, and in the background, while he's showing him what this pen does, beep, 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 and something explodes, in the, in the background, you've got a man who sits on a sofa and disappears. Yeah, he rolls around and gets... You know, and I, I, and it's, it's, anyway, so I, of, of course, I love all this little sort of little clin d'oeil, as we say. I know, you know. but when when they were filming the the Q scenes, isn't it true that um for the the ghetto blaster scene, when they, they got the rocket coming out of the, yeah. the, the big box, Prince Charles was the one who hit the button for the rocket to go. Did he? I think that's right. I think Did that's, he? that's true. Oh, he loves one. He was sitting next to me at the premiere. He kept asking me all, so many questions, um, which I could not answer because he was asking, of course, about all the scenes with the, with the, with the men, the stunts, the this, the that. Of course, that was not in the scenes. So I, I was, you know, I was not an expert, but he loved it. He was having so much fun. 
He's, he's a, very know, he's a talkative. Big fan. And, but yeah. you, you, you went out for dinner a couple of times with Prince Charles and Lady Diana, isn't that? Princess Diana at the time, didn't you? Or did no. you know, down in Monaco, down in... No, South? I was in Cannes, oh, Cannes and right. I was seated next to Prince Charles between him and uh, Alec Guinness. And in fact, we, it was a banquet, it was a big charity after Lindsay Anderson's last film, uh, The Wells of August. Mm -hmm. And we were facing 400 people having dinner, wow. big charity dinner. And I was in between Alec Guinness and Prince Charles, Princess Diana next to Alec Guinness. We were all in a long lineup facing people and having dinner, right? Just like in the old days, you know, Henry VIII or whatever. And of course, the tabloids took a picture selecting just Charles and me talking as if we were having a dinner somewhere private. Oh, right. So, you know. So it wasn't like a... Like no, a... it was gossip. You know, I only <laughs> saw him at the premiere and at this... Uh, uh, I was seated next to him at the, uh, in Cannes in 1987 when I was doing publicity for Bond and it was, uh, this was a big charity dinner uh, after Lindsay Anderson, bless him, his uh, last film, The Wells of August, with uh, Lillian Gish and uh, Betty Davis. Oh, yes. Yeah, she was going to be a Bond villain at one point, Betty Davis. I thought, that's yeah. a random bit of random casting. Fabulous. She would have been, been brilliant, brilliant, absolutely. But brilliant. it's like, my gosh, yeah. I just, you know, that, is, yeah. that would have been, a, uh, you know, quite a... No, the, D Diana and Charles, they came to the studio. They smashed a bottle on yes, the Yes, so that right. was another so episode, fun. so it was fun. I was almost yeah. famous by, by Princess Diana. Oh. But when she was um, just Lady Diana Spencer and she used to work at the kindergarten and um, one of my friends, one of my parents' friends knew her, knew, knew friends of hers and she was going to come around and babysit for us. My grandmother was actually at that time, she gave her a short shrift and said, no, no, it's all right for tonight. <laughs> Thank right. you very much and send her on her way. Yeah. But Princess Diana. Anyway, enough banter. It's, I've kept you for so long. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, so much. You've been Thank such you. a... I hope I've, this is recorded. It, uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I know, really I know. really screwed if it's not. No, no. <laughs> but anyway, this has been Mariam Dabo and Blair Ballard for the Bon Vivant, bidding you all a very Bond farewell. Thanks so much. Thank you. Now, if you've enjoyed this video, please do consider smashing those like and subscribe buttons. Do turn on notifications so you know when the next video drops. Also, leave some comments down below as to any videos you'd like to see in the future. But for now, stay safe, friends. We'll see you next time.